Hey guys, so I think this is gonna be a longer video than usual, so I'm gonna break it up into multiple parts. Part one, guess who needs a haircut? Part two, giving away my book. Part three, childhood wonder. Part four, reading you stuff from my book. So just click, clickety-click, wherever you would like at this moment, right now, and through the magic of technology, you will be whisked away. Part one, guess who needs a haircut and is about to superimpose an arrow next to his head. Part two. There were a lot of really wonderful responses to my video about why librarians are superheroes, which made me feel very happy, not just because people enjoy the video, but because people like librarians as much as I do. Because there were so many great entries, I actually wound up picking more than one person to win a free copy of the Endgames. Anyway, the winner's names are right here, and if you guys would just email me at theendgamesgiveaway at gmail.com, I will get you your signed copy of the book. Part three. One of the things I especially liked about the stories that everybody told was that they reminded me not just of the importance of libraries, but of the wonder of libraries. As I get a little older, I think a lot about the experiences of pure wonder and joy. I think a lot of times we tend to associate those states with childhood, and that we believe the diminishment of them is just an inevitable, 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 inevitable part of growing up. That idea bothers me. I actually tried to make a video about this more than a year ago. I was thinking about wonder's relationship with creativity, so most of the video focused on the act of writing my next book. I could not figure out why I don't think you have to be a child to experience childlike wonder. So for a long time I was kind of like, what if I'm wrong? What if there is no joy in adulthood and there is no wonder? There are taxes and DMV lines and deal with it, baby. So I did what I do when I'm troubled by a big idea. I wrote a novel about it. Part four, this is my next book. It'll be prettier when it's published. Writing Mr. Fahrenheit has been a really interesting journey because for the first two years it was like this really hardcore horror novel and I hated it. I could not get it to work and it was only when I realized that this is really just a much lighter book than the end games in the vein of like Amblin movies from the 80s that the book really lit up for me and I, I like it. Like I, I will be honest I really love the book and I don't normally love my own work and um I don't know, it, it just feels really good. It's been kind of a joy to write it. I'm probably gonna make a video about the book more extensively than I am right now, but I did wanna read the prologue to you because I'm really excited about it and I like you guys. By the way, this prologue is in the Endgame's paperback as a special feature. It's changed a little bit, so if you guys are interested in the writing process, that might be kind of cool. Here we go, prologue. Firelight of the Vanishing Summer, and it opens with two quotes. Quote number one. Magic reminds us that the universe is a huge, capital M, mystery. That's from the movie Seeing is Believing. Second quote. You don't remember me, but I remember you. Little Anthony and the Imperials, 1957. So I don't know if you can see that, but there's a one, and there's a two. And that's because I'm trying this new thing. I was kind of inspired by some early Stephen King books to break up chapters like that into little sub-chapters, I guess. One. He is just a boy, that's all. Just a child walking through the firelight of the vanishing summer's last sunset. He walks with his nerve endings ignited, like constellations. The air tastes dark and electric on the back of his mouth. His sweat molds his hair into sharp broom straw points on his brow. A wind slips by and the witch grass hisses, and the dead leaves grasp his naked calves like hands begging him to go back. No, he tells himself, but it doesn't quite steal him, so he adds, Ellie. And when the boy feels his hands still shaking, he slips them into his deep hip pockets, where he carries magic in the same fashion a gunslinger hauls his iron firepower. The boy won't be held back. Not tonight, and never again. The boy steps into the shadow of the most haunted home in the history of time. His name is Benji Lightman. He's 11 years old. He lives in Bedford Falls, Indiana. And he is walking toward this ancient front door so he can perform his ultimate trick. On the night before middle school begins, Benji will make himself disappear. Two, the house, which is the house, capital H, like hell, has loomed on this hill forever. Benji cranes his neck to take it in, dwarfed by the ghost fortress, which shoots skyward like a jagged arrow fired into the brighter heavens. Benji knows the legends. A crazy hook-handed doctor lives inside the house. Satanic warlocks meet here every full moon to sacrifice stray dogs. The stories aren't true, though. 
They almost definitely aren't true. He asked Papal, who has loomed above Benji Forever 2, and Papal said the stories were comprised of the same stuff that comes out of Bull's ass. Which sounded more convincing this morning, at home, in the sunlight, with Fruit Loops. 3. Now he pauses before the porch step and steals a last glance over his shoulder and sees his friends a world away across the wild yard. Zico, the shorter of them, scrunches his dark face toward the sky, glasses flashing, shoulders hitching with each breath, lips moving in prayer. He's nervous and he does not want to throw up, which he will in fact soon do. A few 8th grade giants stand beside him, long shadowed and stubbled like cactuses, and epic in every way Benji is not. But that is not what Benji will remember most. What he will remember is Christopher Robin Boyton, looking back at him in that blazing August light and bursting into applause. Christopher Robin Boyton, the new kid next door. Christopher Robin, rail skinny and homeschooled. Christopher Robin, who always looks like an unmade bed, but is the only real friend Benji has ever made since meeting Zico in preschool. Yeah, Benji, all right, let's do this, baby, he crows. Wahoo, Benji, wahoo. The eighth graders who brought them here stare at Christopher like an alien, but there is something in that admittedly awkward shout that Benji loves with his whole heart. An unembarrassed joy. It's the sound of someone who is certain something astonishing is coming. Ellie, Benji thinks. Sean Spinney, most gigantic of the old kids, shouts, What, ballin' Benji, you forget your tampon? Benji has no clue what that is. He doesn't let on. Don't you want to join our frat? Hey, if you don't, we can go back. Benji sets a sneaker on the porch, feeling the old wood shudder and cry out through his soul. Four. But he won't be held back, because he knows with the certainty of childhood that behind this red and rotting door, destiny is waiting. From his pocket, Benji draws out his black wand, the great one with the glowing LED tip, and he wants to say Lumos, the way Harry Potter does when he ignites his own wand. Those stories are the same stuff that comes out of Bull's ass, Papal says inside Benji's heart. Lumos, Benji whispers. The wand lights the brass doorknob with a hundred star points, and when Benji's palm meets the metal, the door opens an inch almost by itself. The smell of the house is like darkness and decay and bad memories, but it does not frighten him. He's dreamed every night this summer, almost every night of his life, of something coming for him, something from beyond the rusting silos and gas mining equipment on Bedford Falls' horizon. He's dreamed of a kind of silhouette, a mystery figure, a dark man walking on the moonlit wind to tell Benji a secret. That Benji can disappear, presto, make a metamorphosis, and vanish any memory of the weird kid he's always been. In this dusk light, at the nexus of his life, Benji is about to do that. He really believes that, with his whole heart. He is just a boy, that's all. 5. Benji Lightman opens the door, and the ghosts begin to scream. Thanks for watching! I'm turning 30, and of course, that makes me wonder what it means. I keep thinking about growing up. This will sound funny, but when I was a kid, I became convinced I had x-ray vision. 